Hey everyone, in today's video we are tackling what I think is one of the hardest things to teach in first and second grade, and that is word problems. Now specifically, since this is a K through two type video, we are going to talk about just addition and subtraction word problems, and I'm going to share some of my favorite strategies and ideas for teaching students how to successfully solve these. If you've seen my videos before, then welcome back, and if you are new here, my name is Susan Jones. I'm a former first grade teacher and K through two literacy teacher who now spends a lot of time here on YouTube sharing tips, ideas, and strategies with K through two teachers just like you. My goal is always to make my videos actionable, meaning you can watch my video, take some notes if you need to, and then go and try this out in your own classroom right away. So if you are ready to dive in, give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and let's get started. Now the first thing I want to point out is that evidence has shown for quite some time that when teaching students to solve word problems, it's much more beneficial to get them to really understand what the problem is asking and what you're trying to do in the problem than it is to do things like look for certain phrases, like how many more or how many are left, or circle the numbers that they see in the word problem. Now it's nice for them to go ahead and see those numbers, but evidence has shown that it's most beneficial for students to understand what the problem is asking. Sometimes those phrases can actually end up tricking students, especially as they continue growing throughout the years. Now obviously that is easier said than done, so how are we going to help our students do this? First, we need to recognize that there are about three different types of word problems your first and second grade students are going to encounter. The first and most common type of problem, especially in first grade when you're introducing word problems, are join and separate word problems. Now, when you're looking at a join or separate problem, this is where there is actually an action in the word problem. So in the word problem, somebody is adding to, or they are taking away. There's an actual verb, something is happening in the problem that's adding to, or taking away from. And when you have these types of problems, you can break it down even further, because let's say we're talking about a joining problem, an adding problem, there's three different types. You can have one where the answer is unknown. For example, Fred has two red apples. He bought three green apples. How many apples does he have now? So joining problem, we have two, there's an action there, he got three more, how many does he have now? And the thing that's missing is the answer, right? The sum is missing. You might have the change be unknown. So Fred bought two red apples, he bought some green apples, now he has five apples. How many green apples did he buy? In that one, it's still a joining problem. We had two and then we have some unknown here. So two plus blank equals five. And then there can be the initial quantity that's unknown or the initial amount. So it might say Fred had some red apples. He bought three green apples and now he has five apples total. How many red apples did he start with? Again, still very much a joining problem. We have the verb, he bought it, but in all of those different joining equations, there's a different part that's missing. Now, separate problems are exactly the same as join problems, except with subtraction. So you could have a very similar type question where there are seven birds on a branch, three fly away, how many are left? So that would be actually separating some numbers. The unknown there is the actual answer, so the answer answer is unknown, and then you could do the same type problems with subtraction where different numbers will be missing instead of just the answer. Now naturally when you are starting this off, you will start off with answer unknown type problems for joining and separating. But really what you want students to recognize are join and separate problems and how they have a verb. They're asking for things to get added to or things to be taken away in order to find the answer. The second type of word problem we often see is a part part whole problem. Now unlike a join and separate problem, there are no action verbs going on. Instead, we are looking at different parts of a whole and their relationship. So for example, you might say there are six cats and three dogs at a pet shop. How many pets are there in all? Now again, there's no joining, nothing was added on, nobody came, we're just looking at oh, what is the whole here? We have six cats and three dogs. How can we find out how many there are in all? 
And then of course the other type of a part part whole problem is when one of the parts might be missing. So we could say there are nine pets at a pet store. Six of them are cats. How many are dogs? And again, with these, they are thinking about the relationship of the different parts in the whole within the problem. So we have join and separate problems. We have part, part, whole problems. And then the third type of word problem we see, especially in first and second grade, are comparison problems. Now, with a comparison problem, we are comparing two different completely unconnected sets of things. So it's not a part, part, whole where they, you know, come together to make a whole. Here here we have two different sets of objects and we're trying to make a comparison between them. And these could sound a few different ways. You could have the difference be unknown. An example of this would be Kelly has five popsicles and Shonda has three popsicles. How many more popsicles does Kelly have than Shonda? So there, Kelly has her own popsicles, Shonda has her own popsicles, and we are wondering what the difference is between those two sets. We could also have it where the larger quantity is unknown, so that might sound like this. Shonda has three popsicles. Kelly has two more popsicles than Shonda. How many does Kelly have? So there we know that Shonda has three, and Kelly has two more than that. So how many would that be? Again, they have their own sets of popsicles, but we're comparing them in a different way. And very similar to that, we can also have a comparison problem where the smaller quantity is unknown. And that would sound like, Kelly has two more popsicles than Shonda. Kelly has five popsicles. How many popsicles does Shonda have? So that was a quick rundown of the three main types of word problems your first and second graders are going to see. And the reason we wanna teach them about all three of those types is because that way when they go ahead and read their own word problem or listen to it, they have a much better understanding of what they might need to do in order to solve it. They'll have a leg up on trying to figure out what is this problem really asking me. Now you may have just listened to those three types of problems and thought, that sounds pretty overwhelming to teach my first and second grade students, but you have to remember you're not going to teach them all at one time. You will wanna start with those join and separate problems when you're introducing word problems to your students. And you want to do a lot of them. You want students to hear those different action verbs and get them used to identifying a word problem as a joining or a separating type problem. And another note is that you'll wanna start these word problems with some more simple numbers for students to compute. So try doing word problems within 10 when you're introducing them. You don't want students so bogged down with the size of the numbers that it overwhelms them. You again want them really figuring out what is this problem trying to ask me? Is something joining? Is something separating? What parts of this problem do I know? Do I know the answer to the question and I'm missing one of the parts? Do I know the parts and I'm missing the answer? These are things you'll want to practice with your students over and over and over. Then you can move on to part, part, whole word problems and actually have students compare the verbiage and what each of those different types of word problems actually sound like. Have them notice that there's no action verbs here. With the part, part, whole problem, they're really just looking at the relationship between those numbers. And then of course, after teaching part, part, whole problems, you will move on to comparison problems and again, compare the three different types. So you will want students to actually listen to or read those word problems and determine which type of word problem is this before they even solve it. So as for actually doing these in your classroom, there's a couple things you should keep in mind. Number one is you should have students practice word problems often. You want them to be practicing them all year long. You don't want word problems to just be like one little segment of your teaching curriculum for math. You really want them listening to and dissecting different word problems all the time. A second thing you should keep in mind is that you should be prepared to do a lot of modeling and talking through this problem with your class so they can see what you're kind of thinking and drawing on the board. You should really talk this out with them. Ask for feedback from the class. If they are getting something wrong, that's okay. Have them explain it. Have other students weigh in. Kind of have them talk it out. And then thirdly, I already mentioned this, but you will want to have students start with those smaller numbers, think one through 10 first, because again, you want them to be able to solve these different types of word problems and 
think about what they're asking fluently before you move on to those bigger numbers. Having students be able to identify what a problem is asking is going to be far more beneficial than just throwing those big numbers at them first, but then they can only solve joining type problems or they can only solve separating type problems and they can't see the differences between those type and comparison problems, let's say. All right, last but not least, let's talk about some ways students can actually solve these problems once they figure out what the problem is asking. Step one is going to be what we already talked about, and that is to identify what is going on. Once they've identified what type of problem it is, you want them to make that equation. So if they recognize that the answer is missing, they can go ahead and write the different equation, three plus four equals question mark, or draw a little box or if one of the parts is missing, however they think they're going to be able to solve this, they can write down the equation. That is going to be beneficial for part, part, whole problems, and that's gonna be beneficial for our joining and separating problems. If students realize it is a comparison type problem, they may want to go ahead and use some modeling, so either using manipulatives or drawing pictures to solve that problem. Now, as students progress through solving word problems year after year, there are a few different ways that students typically solve them. First is through modeling, and that can be through using their fingers. So, you know, five birds were on the branch, two flew away, how many are left? That could be drawing pictures and, you know, doing X's through them. That could be putting out five cubes, taking three away. That could also be having five students stand up, act out the problem, be the birds on the branch have two of them fly away, or three of them, however many I said. All of those are different examples you should give your students to allow them to solve the problem in that way. This also adds an extra layer to them actually representing the problem and understanding what it's asking. Now, if it's a comparison problem and the difference is missing, oftentimes we will have students go ahead and draw matching sets. So going back to that Kelly and Shonda popsicle one, if the problem says Kelly has five popsicles and Shonda has three popsicles, you will want to draw five circles at the top, you'll want to draw three underneath, and then you will go ahead and match the sets and see how many are left over. That would be an easy way for students to model that problem and solve it that way. As students become more fluent with these word problems, they will move from modeling over to counting to solve. And counting means like counting on or counting back. So if there is a missing add-in problem, they know that two is one part, plus however many equals six, they'll put two in their head, and they will count on until they get to six to find out the answer is four. They might count back. Now when students are using counting to solve a problem, it is one kind of step up in terms of their understanding, because with modeling, every single cube or finger or picture represents all of the numbers that are in the word problem or equation. And with counting, they're kind of skipping that step. They don't need to draw two circles anymore. They just have that in their head and they're counting on instead. And then naturally, as students become more fluent, they will move from modeling down to counting, down to their simple number sense. And they will be able to pick out those number relationships and know those problems without needing to use their fingers or any manipulatives. Now, keeping that in mind, as students progress through more difficult word problems in second grade, third grade, think up to sixth grade where they are going to be doing number problems with negative and positive numbers. As those become more difficult, students will revert back to counting or modeling to solve the problem because it's a much more concrete way for them to understand what's going on and how to figure out how to solve it. And by keeping that in mind, you'll know it's important to teach those modeling strategies, have students draw those circles, cross them out, have them use the cubes, have them do those comparing sets, have them use a number bond, teach them all different ways to solve these problems. So as the word problems do get more difficult, students can easily revert back and feel confident in solving the problem using whatever model is best for them. Phew, okay, so those are some of my favorite strategies and things to keep in mind when teaching word problems to your first and second grade students. Now, I know that may have been a lot, so feel free to rewind this video, jot down some notes about the different types of word problems and how you wanna teach them to your students. And remember two main things. Number one, dissect different word problems often. And number two, keep those numbers simple at first, especially when you're introducing an entirely new type of word problem. All right, all that being said, I have the bare bones of a product that I'm working on that I think you guys are going to enjoy. So I would like you to write down in the comments, I was thinking about making a product that has, 
you know, some different anchor charts and examples of the types of word problems and what they might look like. And then I was going to include a ton of different examples of those types of word problems for you to work through with your students, along with some modeled ways for how to solve them. So if that's something you would be interested in, let me know in the comments because I have a bare boned outline of a product that I think you guys would like. But if you could let me know if you'd be interested in that, that would be great. All right, as always, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you are notified of every new video I put out, which right now I am doing videos on Thursday and Sunday mornings. See you in the next one. Bye.